November 3rd, 1917. The 65th Congress of the United States of America, known as the War Congress, adjourned three days ago. Here's what they found time to accomplish. They appropriated $47 million for the dredging of rivers and harbors. They passed a law to protect migratory birds, and they voted to establish more federal judgeships. But there was not one bit of action on the suffrage amendment. Alice Paul, who was out on bail and awaiting her trial, led a group to the White House to protest against letting the lawmakers go home. Well, now she is back in jail. P.S. There was a picture in the paper today of an anti-suffrage march in New York showing two women carrying a sign that says, New York State denies the vote to criminals, lunatics, idiots, and women. Can you imagine two women agreeing to carry such a sign? November 4th, 1917. Here's what Alice Paul said at her trial. We are being imprisoned, not because we obstructed traffic, but because we pointed out to the president the fact that he was obstructing the cause of democracy at home while Americans were fighting for it abroad. Well, they gave Alice Paul a seven-month sentence. That is the longest sentence ever given. People are up in arms. She has been put in solitary confinement. There are rumors that she might begin a hunger strike and that others will follow. I cannot bear to think of this. I pray that Mother will not join the hunger strike. She has been in prison for so long now that I don't think she would last if she began to starve herself. I am completely depressed. November 6th, 1917. I saw Celia today, and she said her mother told her an interesting story about Alice Paul in jail. The jail is very stuffy and airless, and Alice Paul looked up and asked the matron why a high window wasn't opened. The matron said if they opened it, it would let a draft in and they would have to give more clothes to the colored prisoners. Alice Paul just snorted and went to pull on the rope that would open the window. Guards came and yanked the rope from her hands. But in her pocket, she always carries a book of verses of the English poet Robert Browning. And she turned and heaved the book toward the window. She was right on target. Yes, bullseye, and the window broke, letting in fresh air. Miss Paul would probably make an excellent hockey player. November 7th, 1917. Flunked a test on binomial expansions. November 8th, 1917. Did really awful on an ancient history test. November 9th, 1917. Miss Pruitt called me into her office and said that teachers have reported that I am inattentive and seem distracted. She asked if something was troubling me. Is something troubling me? That is the understatement of the century. I just broke down in tears and said, Yes, something is as a matter of fact. My mother is probably going to starve herself to death in prison. Miss Pruitt's eyes became misty, and she stepped around her desk and hugged me. It was like hugging an ironing board. She is very flat and stiff. But I couldn't stop crying. I really want my mother back. I cannot stand to think of her growing thinner and thinner every day in cell 21, second tier. November 10th, 1917. The longest picket line ever was at the White House today to protest Alice Paul's sentence. Harriet had a cold and didn't go, but I went and met Celia there. She asked me if I had any messages for Mother. Suddenly I had an idea. Could Celia's mother somehow sneak me onto the prison grounds and perhaps to a spot where at least I could might be able to see my mother from her cell? I know that she does have a cell with a window because she wrote about seeing the sky and how reading cloud pictures is the only reading allowed. Celia said she thought it might be done. She will come by my house tomorrow after school. November 11th, 1917. Guess what? Lunatics, idiots, and criminals did not get to the vote in New York, but women did. The state of New York, with more people than any state in the Northeast, is now a women's suffrage state. It was passed with a referendum vote. This is really good news. Father says it is going to put pressure on President Wilson and Congress to pass an amendment. November 12, 1917. I have seen Mother. Celia came around just as she promised. She brought with her a great gray overcoat in which she wrapped me up and slapped a hat on my head. We then took the number 24 trolley, switched to the 25, and stepped off in front of the city jail. Celia had alerted her mother, who met us at a gate. She led us past two guards. It was dusk, and I stood at the edge of a courtyard sliced by the shadow of a tall chimney. Celia's mother told me to look up at the nearest corner and that Mother would be standing there in a few minutes. 
It was chilly, and that time of evening when everything seems to be darkening into shades of gray, as if all color is being drained from the world. Then suddenly, within all this gray, I looked up and saw white. It was Mother's face at the barred window. It was a shock. I almost did not recognize her. It seemed skeletal, her forehead very large and bony. Most shocking of all, her hair was white at the temples. Celia gave me a little nudge, so I would step out from the shadow of the chimney. I did and took off my hat so she could see me. I raised my hand at the very same instant Mother raised hers. Mother, I whispered. I saw my name form on her lips. I'm all right, Mother. We miss you. Just then we heard a guard, and Celia pulled me back into the shadows, and Mother's face disappeared, extinguished like a small flame. November 15th, 1917. I wrote a letter to President Wilson today and delivered it to the White House gate. A guard patted me on the head and smiled and said, Sure, I'll see that it gets into the, right into the President's hands. I am not so sure, but it made me feel good writing it. Here is what I wrote. Dear Mr. President, I am a 14-year-old American girl, and my mother has been a picket. I have not seen her in more than two months. I have not been able to tell her that I flunked my test on binomial expansions or got an A on a Latin exam. I have not been able to tell her about certain physical changes in me, and I need to ask her some questions because it is simply too embarrassing to ask my father, even though he is a doctor. I was not able to carve a pumpkin with my mother this year for Halloween, as I had every Halloween since I can remember. I have not been able to enjoy any of the inalienable rights as spoken of in the Bill of Rights, because you have imprisoned my mother. Now, I know you will probably say it is her own fault. She deprives herself of these joys and responsibilities of motherhood through her own stubbornness. Let me just ask you one simple question. What is so scary about women voting? I think in your stubbornness you have become a kidnapper of sorts, a kidnapper of my mother. I am sorry to put it so bluntly, but this is the truth. Respectfully, Kathleen Grace Bowen. November 17th, 1917. The hunger strike in the city jail has begun, led by Alice Paul. I am sure Mother is joining it. November 19th, 1917. A message from Mother today. Yes, as I thought, she has joined the hunger strike. She writes that she, along with everyone else on her tier, is refusing food. November 24th, 1917. There is a terrible rumor that both Alice Paul and Lucy Burns are close to death. I cannot bear to think or write any more. November 25th, 1917. Of all the stupid things, I have won the Latin term prize. This seems so ridiculous considering what is actually going on in my life. There is to be a ceremony where I get the award at the annual holiday open house. I didn't even want to go to the dumb open house. I am dreading it because with mother in jail, it will be so awkward. I think I went overboard when I started thinking about how much pleasure my doing well in Latin would give poor old Miss Trout. I didn't think about poor old me. November 26th, 1917. Another message from Mother. I am all right. I feel quite weak, but I have not fainted as some have. They have taken Alice Paul to a psychiatric ward where they threaten to force feed her. I know this is wrong for me to say, but I wish they would do that to Mother. I don't want her to die. She cannot die. November 27th, 1917. They have force fed Mother as well as Mrs. Wilhelm. Mrs. Wilhelm wrote and said it was the worst experience of her life. They stuff a tube down your throat. It hurts, and then they pour down liquids with beaten eggs. They poured it in so fast that she gagged. Father looks like a zombie. Tonight, he said, I cannot believe that we are living in America, within the shadow of the White House. We have decided not to have a Thanksgiving celebration this year. It seems wrong to sit down to a feast when women are starving themselves. The Walcotts invited us, but Father declined. He asked that Marietta just make some soup and cornbread. That's fine with me. November 28th, 1917. The pickets still picket, and the police still arrest them. The news is out about the hunger strike, and it is said the hunger strike is spreading to other jails where suffragists are held. Later finally had a bit of inspiration for my Latin speech for the award ceremony. I was sitting in Father's study at his desk, using the big dictionary, 
when there it was, staring me in the face. His degree from Dartmouth College, with the college motto, Vox Clementis in Deserto, which means a voice crying in the wilderness. Or I think it can mean shout or cry in the wilderness. I asked Father about it, and he said that because Dartmouth College was started in the wilderness area of New Hampshire, with a charter originally to bring education to the Indians, that this is the reason for the motto. Well, I think it might make a good idea on which to base my speech. I can talk about my mater, mother, and Harriet's mater, and every other woman who was picketed and is now imprisoned for suffrage as voices in the wilderness. November 29th, 1917. Mother is now in the psychiatric ward. That is where they put most of them for force feeding, but she still manages to sneak out messages. She said that Dr. Gannon, who was in charge of the force feeding, is the most hated man in the entire prison, for he comes in waving his tubes and jugs of liquid and often calls them Missy and then says, I will show you who rules this place. You women think you do, but I will show you that you are wrong. Father is furious. He has gone to the District Board of Health and is filing a complaint. He called Mr. Walcott and plans a suit and is going to try to get Dr. Gannon's license revoked for violation of his Hippocratic Oath and gross inhu and inhumane conduct, unbecoming to a physician. November 30th, 1917. There are actually rumors that all the women might be released from jail. I dare not think or even hope. Harry and I went to the Ardmore and made a pact that we would not speak a single word about it for fear of jinxing it. So this is the last you will hear of it from me. December 1st, 1917. More stupidity. I am to be an angel in the Christmas pageant. I so wanted to avoid being on stage this year. If I could only have lurked in the chorus, or at best been a shepherd. Shepherds really have very little to do. You sleep at stage left in a heap of smelly old cheesecloth robes, with fabric tied around your head Arab style. Then when the chorus sings, shepherds shake off your drowsy sleep, you get up and lumber across the stage and look at the baby Jesus, this raggedy old doll in a manger. Posy Elder, the clump like an elephant hockey player, is the Virgin Mary. She is a better Virgin Mary than she is a hockey player, I'll tell you that. We would have won the last game of the season if she had not completely missed the puck the single time it was passed to her. Anyhow, being an angel is awful. There are three of them, and you must stand on this raised platform under hot lights in these satin robes and raise your eyes towards heaven. December 2nd, 1917. A letter from Alma. I think she might be falling in love with that fellow with no legs that she has been reading to in the hospital. Everything is Cyril this and Cyril that. I know this sounds absolutely terrible, and I would only write it here, in this diary, but I cannot imagine falling in love with someone who does not have legs. I mean, he would have to have a simply fabulous, great personality. I know I am a narrow type. I finished my Latin speech. It is only 35 words. I had to rehearse it with Miss Trout. She beamed. Tomorrow night is the holiday open house, where I shall be presented with the award. Harriet is getting one for being captain of the hockey team. Susanna Fetters is getting one for proficiency in math. But none of the other winners has to do anything special. Oh, yes. Lila Beth Morse won in French, and she does have to say something in French. December 3rd, 1917. I am so furious. Father has been called away in an emergency, so he cannot come to the Holiday Open House this evening at 7. I have to go with Marietta, and Josh shall drive us. I didn't want to get this dumb award in the first place, and now I have to go all by myself. Well, Marietta counts, but she's not a parent. This is an open house for parents. Harriet's father will be there. Here I am, a virtual orphan, and the holiday season about to start. Where are you, Charles Dickens? December 4th, 1917, just after midnight. I can hardly write. I am so unbearably happy. Mother is back. 
That is why Father and Harriet's father could not attend the open house. All the women prisoners were released. The president knew that the women were unswerving and would starve themselves to death. And if they did, he would have to bear the consequences. So here is how it happened. I was third in line to get my award. Harriet had already received hers, as well as Susanna Fetter's for math. I was wearing my nice blue velvet dress with the hand crocheted collar and a cameo at the neck that had belonged to my grandmother Bowen. I had my speech gripped in my hand. I didn't think I would have to look at it. I hoped, for I had said it about 35,000 times in the last two days. Anyhow, Miss Pruitt was on the platform, and she was saying, And now, for the Cornelia Alder Bennett Award for proficiency in Latin and exhibiting a true appreciation of that ancient culture, Miss Kathleen Bowen. Right before she announced my name, I heard the doors creak at the back of the auditorium. I didn't pay much attention, for people were constantly taking little kids out who whined or who had to go to the bathroom. I got to the platform and received the scroll with my name in gold letters. And then, just as Miss Trout told me to do, I turned and faced the audience, took a breath, and counted to three before beginning my speech. But then in the back, instead of Marietta, I saw the tall figure of my father. So his emergency is over, I thought. But suddenly the breath I was taking locked in my throat. For next to him, her face as pale as a lick of white flame, was my mother. I opened my mouth and instead of the words Vox Clementis in Deserto, there was a shriek, a cry in that auditorium, and the wilderness of the last months dissolved. I jumped from the platform and tore down the aisle. Mother! Mother! I was screaming, and then Harriet spotted her mother, too, and it was all pandemonium, as everyone in the auditorium burst into cheers and hoorays. I ran to Mother and flung my arms around her. I think I actually picked her up. Mother, mother, you're free, you are free. And she was so different. Her hair was almost all white, and I could feel her bones. We kept holding each other away so we could see each other. It was as if we were drinking in each other's face. It was a miracle. My own mother, not dead but alive and before me. I remember having one fleeting thought, which was that I must have grown so much taller, that I never knew how much I'd grown until I measured myself against my mother. Nonetheless, when I hugged her again and looked down at her thin white hair, I knew that I hugged a giant and that I would still have to grow in ways that could not be measured in inches.